Good morning, everyone. Lawrence Fleming here again. I still have a few days left here, and I'm so glad that I'm inside most of the time. I'll continue to do my Bible studies inside, but it's still in the 30s right now, and it's about the same time as last time. I wait till about 10 o'clock, try to get it to warm up some, but just not seeing it. Okay. I'm finding that I've got a few people on other channels anyway that I'm making comments on that are still not getting it. We're in the church age, the Gentile age, if you will. I guess it's probably a Jew I'm arguing with on one channel. I basically, I try to answer a few questions and then I give up. There's some people you just can't reach. Their minds are closed. I don't need them to hear me. I need them to hear God. But if his mind's closed, it's closed to anything that's different than their programmed belief that they've got all these years. It's one of the reasons that the world's not going to see what's happening. It's continuing to get worse. We're still in a rapture watch, and we're going to continue that way probably until it happens because of the, what's going on in the world, not by anything else. We don't have a date that we can look at. We don't have a prophecy. It's the start of things. And things are not ready to start yet. You can see the leaves and colors behind me. You're starting to really look more beautiful. We've got about another month, and they, those trees back there will be barren, except for the pine trees. I still see a lot of solid green leaves, no color changing yet, so until those actually drop, we're still in fall. All right. I'm going to walk over to my seat that I'd like over here. And I find that as I'm talking to some of these people, like I said, they're not open to hear anything. We can't lose focus on what we're supposed to be doing. Pretend that there is no rapture. Now, we know there is one, and it's got to be pretty close, but pretend there isn't. What would you be doing? We're told that we have to spread the gospel around. That hasn't changed, and it won't change. It hasn't changed in 2,000 years. We're told to love one another, to love God and to love our neighbors ourselves. That hasn't changed. We have a special event coming. The problem is, is we don't know when, and we're not going to know when until it happens. So don't drop everything and sit and wait for it. Don't go out by the mailbox and wait for your mail to arrive. You may not get any mail today. Do the normal things that we're supposed to do. We're waiting on God to tell us what he needs us to do each day. We have to find the strength to do what needs to be done. You can't have strength if your focus is on something that you don't know when it's going to happen. There's all kinds of things in the world going on. But I can tell you from experience that if you focus your eyes on all the things going on in the world, there will be enough to occupy your time so you have no time for God. Whatever it is, you know, young people have got their head buried in their phone. 
Jesus could walk right in front of them and say hi, and they wouldn't even notice. You can find something in the world to always keep your focus on, away from God. Satan's good at that. He knows how to play that little game. So don't. Peter walked on water when he kept his eyes on Jesus. You want to do miracles? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Start your day with the Lord. When you get to the end of the day, close it out with them. And throughout the day, if you find yourself distracted, come back to him. He's always going to be there. But don't get pulled off. The little landmines, the bear traps, whatever you want to call them, they're all over the world. God has a map to keep you away from them. But if you're not listening, you're going to be stepping in them. You're going to get hurt. You're going to forget about God. You're going to wander off. You can't take your eyes off of him for very long. <clears throat> I used to fly. I don't anymore. One of the things that we were told to do was to scan. Most airplanes don't have fancy, sophisticated radar that can tell you when there's another plane in your vicinity, so you have to look. But if you stare out the window and don't scan, if you just look in one spot to see if there's anybody going to be in front of you, then you're going to have a very narrow window. Somebody could come in from above or below, and you're neglecting your instruments while you're doing that. So you create a scan. You start off looking at an instrument, maybe another instrument, maybe back at the sky, maybe at another instrument off to the side, and you just keep doing this. You don't do it once. You get into a habit. That way you're looking at the instruments to make sure the plane is running fine. You know, if your car gets overheated, you just pull over to the side and let it cool off. If your plane gets overheated, you have to land. And you can't get distracted by looking at gauges either because then you're not going to see the planes coming at you. The likelihood of, of a mid-air collision is minimal. But you can walk away from a car crash. You can't walk away from a mid-air collision very easily. So it's all a matter of learning to deal with what your situation is. The same thing goes for our Christian life. Look around, look back to God. Look around, deal with people, look back to God. As long as you're doing your proper scan, you'll be okay. But if you get sidetracked, <clears throat> I've seen where I've gotten involved in a, a, a live newscast of some sort, and I'm just focusing on that. And these guys that are doing these things, they, you know, make money off of how much time you watch. So they're going to talk longer than they need to probably. And you can spend two or three hours on there. I'll feel exhausted when I turn off the channel and go on to something else. So I have to make sure that I don't do that either. Now you can put it in a tab on your browser and go back and check on it from time to time. Typically, there's not going to be a whole lot going on that you're not going to be aware of if you go back, you know, once an hour and go look at it and see what they got. Don't focus on things that have nothing to do with God. we got a lot of stuff coming. All the things that are in the book of Revelation are going to start happening. Now, we're not going to be here for them, but we're going to be here for the setup. The earth is getting a lot of earthquakes and movement lately. Some of it's caused by the sun and their super flares that they're getting. Some of it's just caused because that's the nature of earth. We've got earthquake faults that are stuck. They've been stuck for thousands of years. They're due to go off anytime. 
You want to go do and get your chair out and sit by the San Andreas Fault and stare at it? You might spend your entire life there. So you don't do that. You don't do that with everything else going on in the world either. Focus on our Great Commission. That is the most important thing that you've got to do. Get the word out. Even if the rapture is 20 years from now, which it's not, but even if it is, how many people can you save in 20 years? If it's six months from now, how many people can you save in six months? If it's a week away, how many people can you save in a week? The focus should be on getting the word out, helping people. We should also be thinking, you know, about material things, help people to learn to prep a little bit. Might even teach some people how to fast. There might be some forced fast coming up where you just don't have any food and you have no choice. If you've never done it before, it will be difficult. But if you have, you know you can go without eating for you know, a day or two and not suffer anything. Now, there are medical conditions that can be different for people. I understand that. But the average person can fast for two or three days and not have a problem. Water is different than food, but you can usually get or clean up water, boil water, things like that, so you can usually survive with that. You have rain buckets. Some crazy states are passing laws saying that the rain belongs to the state. You can't collect rain. That would get challenged in court and laughed out, but I mean, the problem that we got to deal with now is whether the court thinks it's even worthy enough to take on. They may go, that is so stupid, I'm not going to deal with it. Kick it back down or something, but if they see that people are really suffering and the courts are causing it, they might step in. But it might take a while. So whatever you're going to do, I wouldn't broadcast it. If you're doing food stores, I wouldn't broadcast it. If you're doing bartering with your neighbors, I wouldn't broadcast it. And don't go on social media and think that you're safe there. Whatever you say there is being viewed by anybody who has an interest in whatever the topic is. If you're going out and hunting after hours or when you're not supposed to or in places you're not supposed to, for survival, I can see where you can do that. But I certainly wouldn't broadcast it. Social media can be good for simple things. <clears throat> but don't put things up there that have to do with what's going on in the world too much. Even when I'm talking about here, I'm sure it's being scrutinized. I know that when I upload, it takes a little while for them to approve it. And those are just bots running in the background. If it actually draws people in, they might hear what's going on. I've said in the past, do what the government tells you to do. That's our commandment from, from God, that the government was put here for us until it asks you to do something against God's word. And they're doing their best to push that envelope, believe me. And there are people standing up. And when people stand up, they back down. Satan's a coward. They back down. But they may try to make examples of a few. In parts of the world other than the United States, they already are. We're pretty much not immune from it, but we're pretty much uh, protected because of the laws that we have. Our founding fathers were believers, despite what the liars will tell you. I've got one of the outdoor cats heading here. Meow. Meow. I have a half a dozen indoor cats and probably about the same on the outdoor. They've been fed, especially if you have outdoor cats and you want to take care of them, make sure you feed them. The colder it gets, the more they need fuel. And we're going to be in the same boat. They haven't bought wood here yet. Wood is subject to inflation as well as everything else. A quarter wood is double what it was last year. Double. So 
So they're going to end up with maybe a little bit of wood just for some aesthetic views. They turned their thermostats down here. I've agreed I won't touch it while I'm here. I don't need to wear my jacket inside, but I do wear a long sleeve shirt. I think it's set for 68 or something like that, or 66 or something, I don't know. Whatever it is, it's cool. We all have to adapt. There are riots going on around the world where they're getting tired of dealing with shortages. I think I saw where in France, I think they got, I think I saw where they've got like 2,500 gas stations in France and 2,000 of them are either out or almost out of gas and are rationing it. And that's now. And we're not even into winter yet. We're still dealing with fall. It's cold. But with my jacket and hat and stuff, I can sit out here for a lot longer. But it will eventually get down to you know, 32 or below. We won't get to 50 below like some of the northern states will do. That's why I don't live in a northern state. I still have to deal with the campers that are here. And I still got to decide if God wants me to leave Georgia. I still got, when my son gets back, I still got to keep an eye on him. He's constantly needing help. The younger generation doesn't know how to survive because they never had to deal with things. They had it, they've got it too easy or they've had it too easy. Those times are changing. I know how to survive. I've, I've done survival training in the military, anywhere from desert to mountains to, I've camped in the snow. I've, you know, literally have a, a blizzard going on and it's just like, okay, we can't see. I just stop here and put our tents up and sleep. And of course they're backpacking tents so they're small. I wouldn't be able to deal with my current sleeping situation. That's a base camp situation there. But I've done all that, and I, I can make it. Having done something gives, gives you confidence. That's why you've got to get out and do things. It is going to continue to go downhill. I showed you the chessboard. We're down to the point now where pretty much any move by any of the situations that are out there are going to be an aggressive move. You can only do so much setup, and then you've actually got to do something. You can only rehearse a play so long, and then you got to perform it. This play is about ready to start the first act. <clears throat> I'm looking at some light clouds up above me. No weather, which is good. I'm here until Monday next week, and then I'll be moving to my next site. It seems to be about 10 to 15 degrees warmer than up here in the north part of Georgia, because it's in the southern part. I'll be there for a week. It's a new camp, so I don't know what I'm going to run into when I get down there. I'm getting back on my daily schedule for videos. I didn't know what I was going to run into here and how much I was going to be dealing with, so I recorded a few ahead. It was all in the letters to the churches. So it was one topic. I am going to probably look at a little bit from Acts again, but again, it's just, you know, what they started and then rinse and repeat. The message is always the same. Get the Word of God out. Don't let the authorities tell you to do something that is against God's will. But otherwise, do what they tell you to do. And find ways to work around it. God helped Paul to be clever 
They had so many shrines to gods in the areas that he was in that God came up and said, well, you've got one over there for the unknown God. Well, that's the one I represent. They couldn't argue with that because they had a shrine for him. Well, some of the other stuff got in and bothered some of the, the leaders. And that's about the time he would leave. But he'd set up the church during that time that he was allowed to. Take advantage of every opportunity. Pray without ceasing. Okay, I'm going to go inside and work on my study for the day. I'm not going to talk about the, the rapture too much. It has been and will continue to be imminent. It was imminent in Paul's time. In Hebrews it says we're in the last days. So we've been in the last days since Jesus was here. It's only been a couple of days to God. But all the things that are going to happen are going to happen ahead of us. Most of them are going to happen after we're gone. That's our good news. So keep getting the word out. And keep yourself focused on God. Look at the world, but come back to God quickly. And then look at the world some more, and then come back to God. Don't get distracted so you forget about God. Because that's when you're going to get hurt. Satan can't indwell us because we have the Spirit but he can distract us. He can put up something that looks really good. Oh, God was really going to be nice to me today. He's going to help me out. But it's a trap. Lots of traps. Go back to God and ask if it's okay to do that. It may seem exactly right what you were thinking about, but that's what you were thinking about. Find out what God's thinking about. Now it may be that he really is helping you and it's right there. But don't assume. All right. Let's get into the study. We will get together soon in the clouds. Just don't, don't focus on that. God bless. All right, everybody. Let's go ahead and get on with our lesson here. I'm going to kind of just finish up with Acts on this. I don't plan on doing a whole study on it. The plan of most of my teachings are merely almost topical. Uh, if you've ever gone to a Bible study in a, a full church, they hand out little booklets that everybody gets and the teacher goes through and teaches that, that subject. Well, that's what I've done most of my life as a Christian. I've only recently started this video ministry. So, staying topical. But I will cover some of the history of, of Acts, as I have been doing. But Acts, with, unless I teach the whole book, it can be a problem. The first third is to the Jews, 100%. And some people go through here playing their Bible smorgasbord and go, I have a little bit of this, and I have a little bit of this, and they make up their own doctrine. Well, this is one of the books that they can do that with. Um, if you were to take this in a study, like a seminary, they would call this a transitional book. It's transitioning from what the original intent of God was to come to the Jews. Jesus came to the Jews. He was a Jew. His disciples his apostles were all Jewish. But when he was rejected, then he recruited Paul and the message went out to the rest of the world so we can all be adopted into God's chosen family. And as Gentiles, that's essentially what most of the world is, adopted. Now, that doesn't mean we're to forget about the Jews. Israel, Jerusalem, the Jews are still his favorite and he's going to still try one more time to win them over. And that's where the 144,000 come in, and that's where the basically the remaining book of Revelation is dedicated to getting the world to wake up, especially the Jews. And we're going to live 
in Jerusalem for a thousand years, and we're going to get a new heaven and new earth with a new Jerusalem. So don't write them off. There are those that try to do that. Some of our foundation teachers were anti-Semitic. Martin Luther, all the good that he did with everything else he did, thought the Jews were responsible for Christ's death and therefore should be uh, avoided, hated, whatever. Nobody should teach hate. And those that ordered Jesus killed were instrumental in creating the, the oral Torah, essentially, to carry him forward without the temple. And they put a lot of hatred in there for Jesus and for Christians. All right. <clears throat> I am going to read the commentary here <clears throat> talking about Pentecost. I was talking last time and somebody, um, I didn't explain it thoroughly, and that's one of the problems when you do this in a video without questions and answers is that somebody says, well, what do you mean by that? How come this, you know, I, I thought it was for this. Well, you can't explain it if you're doing a static video. I may have to do a live video here soon. I might do one this weekend. We'll take a look at that. But Pentecost and a lot of this early stuff that went on was for the purpose of establishing the church, to give them a foothold, to help them get started. Miracles that were seen by everybody, healings that were seen by everybody. Ah, I bit my lip earlier, so it's a little sore. Anyhow, and we don't see st things like that anymore. As much as I ask God, he won't talk to me in a burning bush. We don't need it as much because we have the Spirit in us. They didn't have it. Old Testament didn't have that. So a lot of the things that went on back then were time-specific and covenant-specific. So you got to be careful. God's the same. He doesn't change. But if he creates a covenant, and it's an overriding covenant, like Jesus' covenant is an overriding covenant over the Mosaic covenant. So, yeah, you can get to heaven if you can follow to the T every Jewish law. Not the man stuff, but all the stuff from God. If you can follow every law and never make a mistake, you can get to heaven, I guarantee it. God guarantees it. Now, here's a case where you could jump this out of text, right, out of context, and say that I'm preaching heretic stuff here. No, I'm not. Do one sin, and you've blown the whole thing. You can't, man cannot do it. That's why God gave the law to him to prove to him that they couldn't do it. We have Jesus because they couldn't. But if they could, if somebody could have, they could have got to heaven. We have a sin nature, it's impossible. Now, as a Christian, you're going to get to heaven. Even if you backslide and are fully engrossed in sin. If it was a true repentance, a true asking Christ into your life, into your heart, you're bound for heaven. Now, can you accept the mark of the beast if you're a Christian? I don't believe you can if you're a true Christian. I don't think the Spirit would let you. I think before you got that mark, you'd drop dead. God does that sometimes. If you won't come back before you get any worse, he may just take you home. Because you know where you're going to get there. So if you're not going to be any good to God here on earth, there's no point in you being here. Now, he knows those of us that struggle and wander off and come back and wander off and come back. We like the feast as a prodigal son, so we run away all the time so we can come back and get the feast. Well, some people try that. Okay, so I'm going to read this little commentary about Pentecost just to make sure that you're familiar with it. And then we're going to jump ahead of that. Um, 
Pentecost was one of the festivals that the Jews observe both in the Old Testament and in the time of Jesus. Its name came from the Greek word meaning 50 because it occurred 50 days after Passover, one of the three major Jewish festivals, along with the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles, which we just completed. Pentecost was a pilgrimage um, festival, meaning that the Jews came to Jerusalem to celebrate during that week. In the Old Testament, Pentecost was called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. And you can find its meaning back in uh, Exodus 23, Leviticus 23, uh, I think Deuteronomy 16, 17, 16, I think it is. You can go back and look if you want to. Google it. Anything I say nowadays, if you don't understand it, Google it. They haven't banned us yet. So anyhow, why did God choose this date of Pentecost to pour out his spirit? The enablement of the Holy Spirit was for the purpose of empowering Christians to be witnesses and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Luke 24. 49. Pentecost provided a particularly effective day to pour out God's Spirit on the believers because crowds had assembled. Remember, this was a pilgrimage festival. That's why there were people there from all around the world. Their world. All these people that heard it in their own language were there because of the festival. If they'd have picked another week, another festival that wasn't a pilgrimage, there may not have been anybody there. This had the most bang for the buck, if you will. Okay. Um, who was in the upper room on the day of the Spirit outpouring at Pentecost? It doesn't specifically say, but in Acts 2.1, uh, probably indicates that the crowd of 120 that were gathered there um, certainly the crowd included the 11 remaining disciples. Remember, Jesus was dead by now. And uh, Matthias was probably there. Uh, he hadn't been voted on yet. Um, Jesus' mother and brothers were there, as were some of the women who followed Jesus during his ministry. Joseph Barabbas uh, though not chosen as an apostle, probably was also in the crowd because he was one of the two that they drew lots on. So, people getting this started, again, we talked about these, in, in this particular part of Acts, it's all for the Jews. Even the first real on-the-road convert, the Ethiopian, was a proselyte, a Jew by following the rules, learning all the stuff he had to learn, and getting accepted in. So he was a Jew by vote, but he wasn't a Jew by birth. So you really can't count him. You really can't see the first real <clears throat> convert, I think, until chapter 10. <clears throat> I could be wrong. Paul is uh, converted in chapter 9. Um, He's persecuting an eight. The Ethiopians in eight as well. Um, <clears throat> and then you got a little bit of uh, <clears throat> Peter's journey and then Paul's journey. And then they called him back to, I'm just going to summarize the rest of Acts. They called Paul back to Jerusalem to say, what are you teaching? We want to make sure you're teaching the same thing because you are not a true witness of Jesus like we were, the ones that walked with him and listened to him teach. Although Paul did get his message directly from Jesus, it, but it wasn't when he was on earth. So they want to make sure that he had the right message. And then the rest of Acts is just him traveling out on his three, he went on three missionary journeys, basically. So that's the book of Acts. It's an interesting history, but you've got to make sure you pick the rules that you're going to follow 
from Paul's version of the gospel. You have to be saved by accepting Jesus. That's correct. But some people will look at this first seven or eight chapters and go, well, look, if you're not baptized, you're not going to heaven. Well, again, this was to the Jews. And a lot of stuff that went on pre-Pentecost, like all the baptisms, Jesus was baptized <clears throat> when he was here. It's just a outward showing of your belief, but it doesn't get you to heaven. But there are churches that if you don't, you know, I, I joke about this sometimes. There's so many things in here that people try to mirror. And it's one of the reasons we don't have a picture of what Jesus looks like. We don't really know a lot of this stuff back then because we'd copy it. <clears throat> Monty Python did a movie about it called The Life of Brian, about the stupidity of the Church of England and all the rules that they set out and all the things they tried to copy. <clears throat> But we end up with, you know, churches, if you're not baptized, you can't get to heaven. No, except Jesus, only way, period, not by works, lest we should boast. But there are churches that make baptism a requirement to get to heaven. We got other ones that, you know, if you're not speaking in tongues, you can't get to heaven. Again, works. Tongues was used. But it's not necessary. It is something that God chooses to give out where it needs to go. But if it is nothing more than a one-sided babble, and it's like we see in Corinthians, it's just a noisy gong, a clashing cymbal. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I do not have love, you know, chapter 13. So the bottom line is, Tongues are great if it's done properly. If it's not done properly like anything, it can be an annoyance, it can be misleading, it can lead people astray, and it's a good way for Satan to get in and get his false doctrines in. So you've got to be careful. We know we're going to have a lot of, we're going to have signs and wonders in these end, end times, we're told. That's why Jesus said, do not be deceived. But even the elect could be deceived if, if it were possible. Basically, I take that as if we were here. But there will be Christians that are going to be converts even after the first rapture, even after the abomination of desolation, even all the way to the very end. There will be converts. So we're not over with with getting the word out. <coughs> uh, uh, when it gets winter time and you got to turn the heater on, <clears throat> it dries the air out. And I spend most of my time outside, so I don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> but now for this week that I've been in here, it's like, ah. Okay. The bottom line is, Get the gospel out. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what these people were doing. Things that were being set up were to attract attention. The lame walking attracted attention. Now, don't go trying it on your own. It's got to be through the Spirit. If you do it on your own, the blind will walk and the lame will see. It's just like we'd normally do. But if you do it through the Spirit because He directs you to do that, and that's the key, and it really will be happening. But I've asked him why. I said, God, why can't I heal people? Well, do you see what happened when they tried to heal people back then? They healed them. And they drew crowds. And then they had to feed them because there were so many of them. And you will be put up on a pedestal, which was okay when Jesus was doing it. But we don't need to be put up on any pedestal. Pray of course, for people to be healed. But you're frankly better off to do it privately and not even tell people you're praying for them unless you think that will boast of their spirit. But basically, pray for them to be healed. Get with somebody else to a more Jesus is in the midst. Get two people together and pray for somebody. 
Now, you're not going to get any glory out of that, are you? No, people aren't going to come to you. And I think that's by design. If we could go around doing miracles, we would let it go to our head. I'm, I'm sure that uh, it would happen that way. You say, well, how can that be? The greatest creation God ever made. The best angel, the prettiest angel, Lucifer, it went to his head. Are you better than that? I'm not. Okay, just wanted to leave you with a couple of supporting Bible verses here. Um, I'm going to look at, where are we at? John 14, 27. Jesus speaking. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives. There's going to be a lot of attempts to do that. Don't take it. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. So he is coming back, definitely. We don't know when. That's the only thing. It was fun playing the little guessing game for a little while, and we're, we're still in this potential season. But I'm telling you, and I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you until we're caught up. It's not tied to a Jewish event. Not by God's ruling anyway. It may end up being that way, but it's not by design. Satan is going to be handed the keys to the world and say, here, do your best. Now, we got angels holding him back right now. We got things. He's got to work within God's limits. Even when he was tormenting and killing Job's family, he had limitations. He couldn't harm Job, but he killed his family. Destroyed his business. Took everything away from him. Yet Jesus... Uh, was watching in the spirit form. But God basically gave him everything back that he lost plus. And he wouldn't test a believer that way anymore. But this is not testing coming up. This is wake up. You're going to hell if you don't listen. So it takes a special set of circumstances. And Satan's going to get his last attempt to try to win over the world. Unfortunately, too many people are going to follow him. But there will be a lot converted during this time. The numbers in heaven are going to be increasing. But don't, don't want it to start because it's not going to be pleasant. Let's see, where else am I at here? Philippians 4. Well, I want to be, I want to start back at 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Submitting prayer, asking God. You're not going to get anything if you don't ask. Everything that you need God, it's already got in his hands, ready to hand you. You just have to ask. Now, if it's a want, you can still persuade him. He may say no first. You stay at it. If it's something you really, really want, even if it's not good for you, God may give it to you just to prove to you that he knew better all along. Now, it's not 100% guaranteed on the wants, but he may give it to you. Okay, getting back to this. Um, Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Ask and believe. You can keep asking, but don't be a pest. You see? You know, you can come back and check on it and say, God, uh, are you still working on this for me? I don't know. I think it's a need, but if it's a want, you know, 
talk to him, Com conversation. It's a two-way thing. Now, you may not hear his answer back. That's a problem sometimes that we have, but he can at least hear your side of it. Okay. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Keep your mind on good. Because if you don't, Satan will be happy to step in and give you something else to think about. You don't have to wander very far. If you turn away from God and walk away one step, turn around, he's right there. Walk 10 miles, turn around, he's right there. Satan is not omnipresent, so he has to actually put a follower on you to keep track of you if you're worth it to him to, to make stumble. But he'd do the same thing. He'd be around. Now, he doesn't know what's in your head. He can only tell by what you do. So, be careful, be safe. It's not going to be long. We just don't know the date, so don't give up. People are giving you all kinds of false hope, and you've got to be careful. They need to be careful and not give you false hope. We are in the season. Things are very, very close to kicking off. I'm surprised they haven't already. I'm surprised we're not in World War III right now. Because that will be part of the, the seals. We're not there yet. But don't long for it. A quarter of mankind will be killed by one of the seals. That's not, that's not a good number. But that's going to happen. And the seals and the trumpets are going to happen overlaying over the top of each other very fast. <clears throat> but we got to get our two witnesses in place. we got to get our 144,000 sealed. We're passing the baton. So there's still some things that have to be worked out from God's point of view. And the Antichrist needs a good world to take over. So the harlot's preparing things. That clanging in the background is the parrot who's <clears throat> annoyed that I'm not paying attention to him, so he's making noise. Almost a human trait. Okay, until we meet in the clouds, God bless.